paper which was presented. <coughs> Could we be? Yes, sir. Um, could we um, thank you very much um, for having us in the AJMK? Um, we've had uh, a very interesting morning uh, looking at your magnificent country up here, and we've also had the pleasure and the privilege of speaking to a number of your people who, as uh, we've been told they would be, uh, were very warm, welcoming, and friendly. We have also had uh, a number of briefings uh, from the army officers in the area, which have been very ins instructive, but as uh, we might have expected, they have placed before us the formal position. We have also been to Kashmir on the Indian side, and again the army officers there briefed us on the formal position. However, when we met the governor of Kashmir on the Indian side, he gave us his informal views, which differed in some important aspects to the official line given, and indeed helped us to understand the subtleties and the difficulties on both sides of the argument. I wonder if it would be possible, sir, for you to share with us, quite off the record, because uh, we're not press, we're not representatives of uh, uh, our own government um, from the members of the course, and it, your words would be used only to educate our ignorance and would not be used in any political way. And so we'd very much value, sir, your personal views on the Kashmir problem. <coughs> and then I not only greet you, welcome you here, to this territory, but in fact we are thankful to you for coming here at all. It has been a very valuable exercise with our friends from abroad uh, visiting us uh, time and again. And the last year and a half um, we have had uh, quite a number of uh, very senior uh, delegations. And uh, in retrospect when I think about it, I feel it was very rewarding <coughs> because our point of view in the past uh, three and a half, four decades uh, went almost by default. We had not been able to explain our position directly to the people concerned. <coughs> so we are grateful that you are here. And, uh, <coughs> for your uh, last remark about uh, uh, an informal interaction. Uh, I, even temperamentally, I've been very informal and uh, I've had no reservations about it. And it's not, uh, it never serves any good purpose uh, to hide things when you cannot hide them, in fact. Uh, things are known about Kashmir and uh, South Asia and elsewhere that Sometimes I feel that people know more about it themselves than, than we know <laughs> we know about them. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I feel quite um, comfortable with whatever information I have, and uh, it would only be I would be only grateful if uh, you find anything missing. You are at liberty to ask uh, anything that you are, you might want be wanting to know, and um, I would probably be thankful to you that. Uh, you went back uh, without any hesitation or without any doubt about anything uh, regarding us. <coughs> Sir, with this, uh, these few words, uh, thanking you and welcoming you to Azad Kashmir, I'm also sure that with the passage of time, in particular these two years that we have had, a lot of information uh, is already available on the genesis of the problem and the background and so on and so forth. Uh, but the fast changing scenario with regard to Kashmir naturally attracts uh, attention time and again. <coughs> so I would not bother you much with, with the background knowledge and information. Uh, <coughs> Except that uh, 
Kashmir issue has a, a typical background of its own, uh, starting from uh, um, the time of partition with the Red Cliff Award, moving gradually on to the Cold War and the end of Cold War, and now the new situation which is confronting us in Kashmir, and because of Kashmir, the, it, it confronts the uh, whole of uh, South Asia region, particularly the subcontinent as a whole. <clears throat> that is why perhaps it is very important, otherwise uh, if it was only um, a few thousand square miles of area in Kashmir and a few million population, uh, perhaps the world as it seems today would not have bothered much about it. But uh, through the Kashmir problem, the situation becomes very grave and it is fast escalating, uh, coming every day, with the passage of every day, nearer to a sort of a final end, uh, which might, uh, in my humble assessment, uh, end up in a nuclear holocaust or, uh, in the least, uh, a military confrontation between the two countries. <coughs> And the military con confrontation, when we talk of military confrontation, uh, it, it will not be, <coughs> uh, in my opinion, like uh, the one we had experienced thrice before in 47, 65 and 71, but it might be totally different this time. The preparations of all these uh, 50 years that have been made, the hatred which has generated ever since, and the way things are developing <coughs> on uh, the Indian side uh, alone. Um, are very uh, horrifying as a matter of fact when we look, one looks at them in, from that point of view. So, sir, uh, without taking you back to every detail, the situation at present <coughs> is that um, luckily, or as the situation would ha have it, uh, Indian leadership has been uh, exposed for the first time to the world opinion directly. It is strange for me to say that it is for the first time, it has been there for 50 years, but I should directly expose uh, the presence of Cold War, uh, <coughs> uh, like uh, many other mischievous boys, uh, one tended to forget and forgive and ignore many things. But now we are faced with, uh, directly faced, are confronted with the with, with, with gross, uh, ground realities of the situation. And that way people have learned more. Uh, I've been recently out to the United States, Canada and England, um, and I have a feeling that uh, people have started realizing uh, that many of the things which they thought uh, to have been uh, taken for granted are not real and they need to be readdressed uh, or reviewed uh, immediately. Uh, of them, India, uh, lately India has been trying to capitalize on uh, what it calls the integral part of India, claiming Kashmir to be the integral part of India, and uh, calling this movement as a cessationist movement, cessation. Well, even the prestigious institution like BBC sometimes back uh, said the same thing, uh, that the cessation, cessationist movement in the northern part of India and that sort of thing. But gradually, uh, that uh, dust which had, which had been kicked up by propaganda is uh, being removed and people are seeing the realities themselves. <coughs> and I tried to explain, um, incidentally I'm reminded of this during my visit uh, to the people that when they call Kashmir as a cessationist movement, uh, I hope the Indian authorities realize the danger in it. Uh, this is an international recognized movement. If you bracket it with the Khalistan movement and Tamil and, and other movements, then all of these people will tend to come together and we have scrupulously avoided uh, involving ourselves into uh, Khalistan and other, other movements. I personally uh, <coughs> have uh, tried to keep away from it. So they are, they are realizing that also. For, as far as the integral part is concerned, sir, for your interest, <coughs> and we are quite uh, conversant with the whole thing, surely. I felt this time that uh, one of the uh, elements which India is using uh, to its uh, advantage is uh, uh, is a threat, threat perception uh, on the basis of uh, resolution of Kashmir issue. 
I was asked directly by some media men, very senior people and people in the, the policy makers in various countries uh, about the uh, truth of Indian contention that if Kashmir issue was resolved, India would break up. So day to day, during the course of discussion, I felt that uh, they seem to be projecting the idea. Uh, three things they seem to be projecting. One is that uh, the retention and maintenance of uh, their great democracy, which is under threat, and uh, their uh, uh, integrity and their uh, secular stance. So all these three things seem to be under threat and they need to be assisted uh, in order to be defended. And then I, I tried to explain uh, my point of view to them that we are interested in uh, the democratic uh, continuation of democracy in India. We are also interested in retaining its secular stance and we are also interested in its integrity uh, no matter the hatred and ill will which has been generated over the years and the people emotionally turn around and say well if it, it breaks up it breaks up. But I personally have not advocated that. I have been um, quite conscious of the fallout of uh, such an accident if it ever takes place you see and then nobody on the subcontinent would be safe. So it will affect everybody, not only the Indians. Although they've been the engineers, they've been the pioneers. They started this, this, this sort of a thing in East Pakistan and they continued uh, pressurizing uh, Pakistan on all sides. But uh, even then, uh, sanity should prevail and uh, we should not be led away by emotionalism. <coughs> That's they've been uh, discussing the question of fundamentalism in Pakistan, rise of fundamentalism, but thanks to the uh, election results in Pakistan that uh, that bogey of fundamentalism has also been very badly exposed. Although in fact there is no uh, such thing as fundamentalism in Islam, but the way it has been interpreted in the West, uh, it has been used to fully on the sensitivities of the, of the Western world. <coughs> but however, that has also been very badly exposed. Uh, and I think if he had a little more time, perhaps uh, none of those people would have uh, returned at all. Uh, they would just be wiped out. But on the other hand, uh, I've been telling people that in India at the moment there are 117 militant Hindu fundamental seats uh, in, in the parliament and they tend to increase uh, with the passage of time. So that, that also by itself uh, constitutes a very <coughs> positive threat uh, to democracy and secular stance of India and also its uh, integrity. However, the other thing which has been discussed with me during this uh, recent tour and which might be of interest to you also is the various possibilities. The, you know, the, the United States uh, recent uh, statement by President Clinton himself and then Secretary General statement by him and the U.S. State Department and in Canada and, and wherever I went, uh, I felt that there is a lot of sympathy primarily on the violation of human rights. And uh, <coughs> there's no explanation whatsoever. They try to equate it with Pakistan uh, terrorism and so on and so forth, but uh, the people know in their hearts that it has uh, no similarity, it doesn't bear any similarities. And there's some, somewhere there is terrorism, somebody is committing terrorism, somebody is violating human rights elsewhere. Uh, Kashmiris cannot be punished for that. <coughs> so uh, they now realize, and I, I felt quite um, clearly the uh, sympathy which is expressed. Uh, <coughs> and I talked to all walks of life, uh, media men and uh, diplomats, politicians, intellectuals, uh, both uh, the people belonging to those countries and the, um, the immigrants. Uh, and everybody uh, is convinced that India is in the wrong. And uh, in the first instance, um, this uh, brutalization of uh, human rights must stop, must come to an end, and the world must put pressure on India uh, to stop this in the first instance and then address the Kashmir issue. Uh, there, some exercise had been undertaken in Washington last year and there's an exercise being undertaken in Brussels uh, very recently uh, on the 18th and 19th by the European Parliament. And some other people have also been carrying on uh, with, with, uh, with a second, third line, uh, third track um, diplomacy and uh, trying to bring about some sort of understanding. <coughs> but every, everything gets stuck up when India turns around and says that uh, it's an integral part of India and no country has the authority to uh, interfere in internal in, in affairs. 
However, <coughs> that's not left to the world to decide whether it is actually an internal affair or not. Uh, I, I don't think the world today believes in this internal affair movie. Uh, it was used as a ploy during the Cold War, but after the Cold War, I think things settled, settled down automatically. Uh, then they come to discuss various possibilities. Uh, you might like to call them options or possibilities or various suggestions. And they start from mediation um, down to uh, partition, Dixon plan, and uh, then um, some regional plebiscite and uh, some plebiscite on the ethnic basis, and uh, independent Kashmir and uh, sovereign status to uh, Kashmir as a whole, and then sovereign status to both that part of Kashmir and this part of Kashmir. <coughs> And all these things have been uh, discussed uh, time and again with me during my recent visit and even otherwise before that. And we try to explain to them uh, that we are not adamant, uh, we are not insisting on anything particular. All we want is that uh, the issue should be resolved with the reference to the will of the Kashmiri people. It is they who should decide what is, what is to be done. The, during the course of that uh, discussion, um, Somebody suggested, somebody said that perhaps India would not like to part with the Hindu majority area, uh, the Jammu, um, Jammu province as a whole, and, uh, and, and Ladakh. <coughs> um, but then I, uh, I still maintain that uh, if that is going to be the ultimate decision and that can settle things, um, I suggested that instead of Pakistan and India, uh, getting down to divide the country, <laughs> divide Kashmir like this, and then keep the issue burning because the two Kashmiris like burn, burn and wall would like to join it any time. So they'll keep on struggling for it uh, and then ultimately join it. Instead of continuing with that irritant, uh, why not uh, bring the uh, non-Muslim population in Kashmir and the Muslim population leaders, leaders from both sides sit together as a whole and then uh, find out whether they can live together in peace or not. I personally believe, knowing history as I do, that there has never been a single incident of uh, ethnic violation uh, anywhere on the side of Kashmir. Whatever the violation took place in 1947, it was 100% uh, outside intervention by the RSS, uh, the armed trained groups imported from, uh, from across India. Uh, to Jammu, and it is they who, who caused that uh, uh, that carnage. But if the, if the, the non-Muslim population is allowed to sit with us, and we discuss it out with them, and assure them uh, whatever the assurance they want from us for any political arrangement that they might like, might like to strike, um, there will be no need to partition uh, Kashmir on the basis of uh, religion. <coughs> uh, that that's what we've been trying to explain uh, to them, but we were not insisting on anything particular except uh, that the movement now has to go on. There is no way back, uh, there is no rollback on the movement. Uh, I mean, Indian, Indians have left uh, actually no, no way out for the Kashmiris to roll back. What they have done to their women, folk and children, burning them alive and destruction and this havoc caused it's not merely the handful of militants. And, 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 and so you people from the defense could appreciate that uh, in that small area and that population of six to eight million, six million, five million people, Muslims alone if you count them, uh, they've been uh, under uh, uh, over half a million uh, troops deployed in that small area. Perhaps this is, from, from my knowledge, it's perhaps the highest uh, military concent concentration uh, ever in the history anywhere in a small area like this. And then they go on adding to it. Uh, fighting a handful of militants. It's something, something unbelievable. I'm a military man myself, but I would not have replied more than a brigade uh, at, at the most you see to fight a handful of militants. It is the whole population, as a matter of fact. Uh, every man, woman, child who is against them, and not because they, they were against them, but because of their treatment meted out to them. So, in fact, if you look into uh, what has happened, uh, one feels that uh, Indian authorities, in, the, in their heart, in their mind, never accepted Kashmiris as a part of their, their polity and part of their country. Uh, they have uh, killed Sikhs, uh, destroyed their golden temple and whatnot. But I, I don't remember any, any Sikh lady having been treated the way they treated our women folk in, in Kashmir. So, I mean, that is very clear. There's, there's no doubting the fact that the Indian authorities do not uh, treat uh, the Kashmiris as their own people like they claim to be their integral part. 
and that is what led uh, the Kashmiris to, to, to a revolt of that nature in which not only the handful of militants but it is uh, the whole of the Kashmiri population and when some they talk of uh, militants, uh, people outside who, do, who, who are not conversant with the actual facts of life, they might be thinking that there's a huge army uh, fighting uh, to fight uh, half a million uh, regular troops. You, you need at least half a million if not more. Uh, but if you go down and find out the statistics, you will see that there are, there are a few hundred boys with gun running and of them, uh, I think, uh, a very negligible number might have had training in Afghanistan or here on this soil if they could manage it. And the kind of quality of weapons that they possess, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm also surprised that it's only a kind of toy weapon. Russian Gov is no weapon to fight a regular army. Nobody, everybody knows in the world that the, the best of the weapon that they have is the Russian Gov. Uh, very recently we heard that some sophisticated weapons, a very limited number, are trickling into the into that side from the operational reports one can judge that there is some, some improvement and that improvement will of course uh, um, the experience and time uh, teach, teaches you you see that uh, that improvement automatically uh, <coughs> there has been some improvement uh, the, the crux of the whole thing today boils down to this that uh, um, no matter uh, how much uh, the quantum of uh, militancy reduces in Kashmir uh, Indian Army perhaps will not be able to reduce the numbers so the, it has deployed the military, military personnel and that therefore uh, the economic burden and the political situation will continue to be grave uh, as it is and the two countries spending more than 10 billion every year on defense build up and then nuclear capability and all this put together uh, I'm absolutely convinced that if ever there is going to be a nuclear strike anywhere it is going to be on the subcontinent unless it is diverted to uh, very uh, scientific and systematic manner. I, I, I explained to the State Department in the, in the United States that uh, even if Kashmir issue is resolved, things have gone to that such an extent that some other mechanism, equally effective mechanism, will have to be evolved in order to bring peace to the two countries. But they have gone to such an extent, they deployed so much of resources against each other that uh, maybe it is not uh, within their powers to withdraw the whole thing uh, even if they want to do that. that. That is the situation. So some other institutional arrangements will also have to be worked out uh, so that there's peace between the two countries and this defense spending is cut down and the nuclear threat is called off and uh, this money is, is spent uh, for better purposes uh, to serve, serve the people on both sides. So that is how things are uh, moving uh, at the moment. And uh, the rest will lead to your questions. So this, this was briefly what I wanted to present to yourself. Well, can we thank you, Prime Minister, for a very candid and illuminating um, analysis of a very complicated situation. I wonder if I might start off with the first question Please. and pick up on the stress that you lay on dialogue. Now, we've all seen um, an instance recently of the advantage of covert Yes. dialogue yes. under the sponsorship of a, a third nation uh, in Scandinavia producing quite a dramatic and yes. unexpected yes. result in the Middle East. I appreciate therefore that you may not wish to share with us um, any uh, information that you have on dialogue which is going forward between India and Pakistan on the uh, Kashmir um, situation but are you able to just give us a, a, a flavour on how it might be approached and whether there are indeed any third parties um, attempting to assist with the resolution of the uh, problem and how this might relate to the very important point that you ended up with there and that is the interrelationship between uh, the micro problem um, of Kashmir and the macro problem of the relationship between India and Pakistan and India. So thank you very much, uh, <coughs> and uh, I would love to um, divulge everything that is to my knowledge because there may, maybe there are many things which I do not know. With these these covert um, uh, this covert exercise, you know, sometimes uh, it is not known to many people who are very much concerned and directly involved. But what I know is that uh, about six to seven years back. Uh, uh, the American uh, Peace Institute uh, in, the, in 
Washington started off with an exercise like this. Uh, and uh, after some time, um, I think about after three or four years of this uh, uh, quiet uh, movement here and there, uh, they came out with uh, a concrete shape uh, in two ways. One was to uh, encourage a dialogue between intellectuals from India and Pakistan. So that, uh, I think two or three, uh, twice or thrice, that exercise was undertaken. Um, <coughs> Um, and uh, intellectuals of very high level, uh, civil, um, journalists, uh, they, they exchange delegations, uh, Delhi to Sambal, Sambal to Delhi twice or thrice. Um, but I think they, either, either it was too high profile activity and therefore they started playing to the galleries and, <laughs> and as one of the Indian intellectuals during the course of that exercise, he said to me, he said, Sadar uh, Fayyum, uh, no matter what the two prime ministers say inside, but they don't have the courage to address the people outside. <laughs> that, that has been the unfortunate aspect. So, so that did not produce any result. Uh, but it did uh, set the ball rolling and many people started seriously thinking about it to see that whether the exercise could have continued. Then uh, immediately after that came this exercise in Washington where the Peace Institute uh, uh, instituted a meeting of the intellectuals from both Pakistan, India, and both sides of Kashmir. I mean, the, the governments were not consulted generally, uh, except that the Indian government might have been consulted in order to uh, permit some people to come out. Uh, from our side, there is no restriction. Anybody who want, wants to go can go. But from their side, uh, it was restricted. Uh, that, that report need, uh, need, needs to be uh, really studied. It was a wonderful exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought something will come out of it then, but then the Indian authorities perhaps um, realized the folly of that uh, permission and uh, they tried to block the way for future. But then, uh, following up on that, uh, the socialist group in the European Parliament uh, initiated uh, another meeting in September, uh, which, was, uh, which was met with failure again because of Indian intransigence and they didn't, they didn't want to allow anybody to come out. But the pressure has been gradually mounting. Ultimately, the result is that in, um, on the 18th of October, uh, some breakthrough has been made and uh, a closed-door meeting is scheduled uh, to take place, um, inviting people, although the level of people they have invited is not uh, that serious, unfortunately, particularly from the Indian side. Uh, but still, uh, there's, there's some, some breakthrough. Now, besides that, some, some other um, unofficial dialogue has been going on between the government of Pakistan representatives and in repre representatives, uh, short of the prime ministers uh, at the, at the second, second level, the foreign ministers, for example, and their friends, and some other people who, are, who will influence but hold no office like that. <coughs> and in the third, uh, at the third level, some dialogue with me had also been opened up um, in, in the UK and the United States uh, by um, officials of, uh, of uh, third level. And in fact, last year we came very close to, um, to, 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 to some tangible uh, outcome, but unfortunately it was again swept away. Uh, there was a suggestion that uh, while uh, the fasting month, Ramadan, was approaching last year, there was a suggestion that the, the both sides call the ceasefire for the time being in, a, in order to provide uh, for uh, creation of a conducive atmosphere. Uh, but then we got stuck up, the time was very short, and, uh, and the Indian government uh, wanted us uh, to call a ceasefire first. But I, I tried to explain to them that nobody from our side, including government of Pakistan, wields any authority over the militants. We have a moral obligation, and we can only morally appeal to them and request them, provided there was something tangible from the other side, from the major partner. Now, the major partner was not, uh, the major party was not prepared to uh, share it with us, although they, it was suggestion came from them. But we were ready to respond positively uh, on that. So that exercise is also continuing. Uh, that way, uh, then I, uh, Lord Avery, 
uh, is also conducting a similar uh, effort and uh, I, I assured him of any support that he wants from us. And uh, besides Lord Elbury, I think there are other MPs, British MPs, uh, who have shown quite a lot of interest in this. And then uh, in the United States itself, some congressmen like Dan Burton and uh, uh, Stephen Solas particularly, um, who were uh, poles apart as far as Kashmir is concerned. But then I managed to bring them together and I said instead of uh, you know, fighting on two different fronts, why can't we combine our efforts in a goodwill form in, instead of confronting uh, India, uh, a big power, and then they make it a point of prestige also. And sometimes for, you fight for prestige beyond realities. <coughs> uh, and they agreed uh, with that. Uh, they said we will we'll form a congressional committee uh, to have private dialogue uh, with, with, uh, with the Indian side and, and Kashmiri leaders and help. And then I have suggested very recently uh, that we, we would uh, accept or agree to whatever is uh, decided um, by the leadership across the ceasefire. In fact, we have surrendered uh, our uh, authority or the, our position, political position to them uh, in order to facilitate uh, a dialogue which the Indian side is also trying to, to conduct and some other from the United States and Europe and elsewhere people are trying to conduct that. So that way we have, we have helped the, um, the process. <coughs> Sir, but where we uh, ultimately uh, would be stuck up uh, is the very, very unrealistic attitude being adopted by India, uh, failing with all arguments and reasons. Uh, they come out uh, with a waving fist and say that we do this to you and do that to you. And so that's where we are stuck up. Otherwise, uh, I think the atmosphere is very conducive and we are prepared to lend support to anybody, to European community, to, to Britain who is, who is involved from the very yes. first day uh, and to the United States to uh, bring about anything which is reasonable, which is acceptable. You see, if the people can accept having laid down their lives and property and suffered so much. And that, that can, of course, not be ignored. But nothing, nothing positive has been suggested. But the exercise, as I told you, I've given you the entire account of, detailed account of the exercise, which, to my knowledge, uh, is, is, has taken place so far. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Would you agree to take uh, a couple more questions? Fine, fine. I'm at your disposal. Any, any questions? Any kind of question? Prime Minister, yes, sir. Uh, common cases in the world of press have speculated that Kashmir and Germany seek This is another very uh, complicated question which has been addressed uh, time and again by very senior senior people. And uh, what I have been saying in, in response is I just explained to you myself. <coughs> One is that uh, if India is prepared to part with Kashmir on the basis of granting independence uh, to the Jammu and Kashmir state, uh, we will have no objection to it. Whether Kashmiris have asked for it or Kashmiris have not asked for it, what, what is it that the Kashmiris want? I mean, if India is prepared to uh, uh, concede Kashmir away on that argument, on that uh, plan, uh, Pakistan side and our side, we will not. We are not in a position to tell India to uh, keep its stranglehold, maintain uh, on on Kashmir, and let the Kashmiris suffer. So we agree to that. Secondly, uh, if you ask the Kashmiris for that matter if you leave it to Kashmiris, uh, then we come, we are faced with two situations. One is the United Nations resolution together with the partition plan which does not provide, which rather pro prohibits uh, anything like an independent state <coughs> on the subcontinent. That is one. And the second one is that if we go back to only two uh, uh, options granted by uh, the United <coughs> Nations resolution, of exceeding with Pakistan or India, then of course the choice uh, of uh, the overwhelming majority of Kashmiris would be to opt for Pakistan. Even if a third choice, by some stroke of imagination, which I actually have no access to, of who is going to create this third option, is the United Nations going to create it, is it India who is prepared to accept? The Indians, 
they get they do not they do, do not want to hear the word uh, independence uttered anywhere uh, before them because they say that more than 600 states will become independent and it will upset the entire partition plan and so on so forth and that argument might be valid or might not be valid but that is the one of the arguments that they advance but then if uh, it comes to even a third option is carved out by some some imagination uh kashmiris will over the majority will still vote for pakistan given a choice but if there is no choice and the indian authorities want to quit kashmir on the basis of uh, granting independence sovereign status to uh, the kashmiris perhaps pakistan and the kashmiris will have no objection to it so incidentally two years back uh, this was a, this was a part of a suggestion which was brought by mr steven solar when he visited the say uh, two years back one of the suggestions he made was to have free and fair elections supervised by the united nations or us and then kashmir is being given the right of choice uh, the second was uh, an independent kashmir but when i asked him i perhaps some how the other it, whether it's intuitional or whether it is through uh, a, a, a continuation of exercise but i felt that uh, mr solars was uh, meaning something different to what he was saying so in order to find out what he was saying i said all right mr solars uh, how would you put it into practice what that mean granting sovereignty and independence to 84000 square miles of area uh, i said no it is very difficult because india would not like to part with the uh, hindu majority area i said or i said all right let's concede hindu majority area to india is is it possible to grant independence and sovereignty to the rest of the jammu and kashmir state he said no it is it is it will be difficult again because if you give something to india something in the package will have to be given to pakistan yes. so if you give something to pakistan in the package and uh, northern area uh, is the minimum azad kashmir in northern area both or at least northern area then i said all right what about the rest azad kashmir and uh, the rest of the valley will they, will they get sovereignty uh, we said well that is again very difficult um, i was president and the president is very difficult Uh, you see, 600 states will uh, ask for independence. So that is, I said, then what are we trying at? I said, Mr. Solar, what are you trying to suggest? He said, isn't is it not possible to fly both the flags on 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 Sri Nagar? I said, that perhaps is is, is going too far. I said, <laughs> to asking too much from from the Kashmiris. So that is it. Then then I also uh, suggested to them that uh, when we talk of independent Kashmir, we must not forget. that the that china becomes a party to to any change which is affected in the un resolutions and they have reserved that right in in the sino park agreement they have reserved that right to them uh, in case of any change in that plan so they we open up the area you see uh, we widen the scope of settlement and make it more confused uh, than trying to settle so that's the, that but i said if, um, if by any uh, stroke of luck somebody can work it out Uh, to 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 make it possible to settle it at that, not that uh, I am in favour of uh, believing that uh, Kashmir is a viable entity as a, as a sovereign state. I don't think it is viable at all. But but to, in order to settle the dispute for the time being, one could say that uh, in the interim arrangement like uh, like the Palestinian question that will also take quite long time to to be finally settled. But for the time being, one can. Contend that uh, an independent Kashmir uh, might be feasible, but uh, who, who is going to implement it and how? And I am reminded of what Jawaharlal Nehru said, uh, late Prime Minister of India. He said uh, they can afford to give uh, Kashmir to Pakistan, but they cannot afford to have it independent. This was said by Jawaharlal Nehru himself in the very early. I mean, they see the implication of an independent state for what is going to be. For us, there is not, not, not much of an implication. But for them, uh, this is perhaps the most difficult thing to digest. So uh, there is no, uh, no, no tangible, uh, concrete uh, proposal as yet. It is all uh, you can call it a sort of uh, an exercise, finding out ways and means what to do. But at the moment, we are stuck up uh, in a position where we only have to create a, an atmosphere conducive to a dialogue. Even, we are not even at the dialogue stage at, <laughs> at the moment, not to speak of a resolution of the problem. But we are still a, a step, uh, step behind, and we are prepared to lend any support to that. Professor, what is it uh, about Kashmir that uh, lays claim to uh, independent status from India? Is it uh, that the uh, majority of the population are Muslim, or are there other factors at play? Is it purely the, the Muslim factor um, that does not create? Sir, so what has?
has uh, uh, led to the creation of this idea. Uh, <coughs> it's not a new idea. It was there even pre-partition days when Sheikh Abdullah launched that the Quit Kashmir movement. Even then, even at that time, he had talked of Kashmir, and it has its roots, its roots back in the 30s. 30s, there was uh, Russia's Asian Security Plan. You might have heard of it, and that plan envisaged Kashmir, Frontier Province.